All right. Good morning, all. Very exciting stuff today. We're going to be going over Affiliated 1031's webinar on all sorts of educational fun nugs. And I'm excited to get you in and introduce you to the team. We're going to be taking this webinar for about an hour. And the last 15 minutes will be a question and answer. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We'll make sure that we get them answered. And make sure that you hit the website and download additional information. So we'll go ahead and get started and jump right in. And first, what we're gonna cover today is all about what an IRS code 1031 is. We're gonna talk about a little bit about the process, what takes place throughout that process and how you can best position yourself to grow your business and your real estate assets using this amazing tax deferral strategy. So now we'll get into the team. And you see the amazing affiliated 1031 depicted here. Today, we've got Ricky, we've got Stephen Weiner, and we've got Stephen Girion. And I'll let them talk, introduce themselves a little bit, and just share what got them excited and got them started in 1031. We'll first start with Ricky. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ricky Guerrero uh, with Affiliated 1031 Exchange. I am a attorney and an exchange specialist and looking forward to uh, being part of this webinar and, and educating all of you on a 1031 exchange and its benefits. Good morning, everyone. Stephen Gurian here. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing law 10 years and I have a master's of law in taxation, which means I'm a sucker for punishment. Decided to spend an additional year in law school and another $50,000. And I'm also an exchange specialist. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm a certified exchange specialist. I've been doing this for over 25 years and have seen almost every type of problem area in the 1031 industry. So we're going to discuss what its Section 1031 exchange is, how you get involved in it, what the timelines are, and some of the rules. The first item is understanding a Section 1031 exchange. I want you to understand that one of the reasons that people want to do a 1031 exchange is they want to defer paying their taxes. And one of, what we're going to show you on the screen is an example. So looking at the example that you see on this screen, we have an initial purchase price or sales price of $100,000. You have two different uh, columns. You've got a sale column and you've got an exchange column. The first one we're going to use as an example is if there was just a sale. You're not doing a 1031 exchange. You bought a piece of property originally for $100,000. You sold it for $750,000. You're going to have a capital gains tax of $150,000 on that transaction. If you paid that tax, you would only have left in your pocket, as you can see on the screen, $600,000. And if you use that $600,000 as a 25% down payment on a, another property, you'd be able to buy $2,400,000 worth of property. However, if you were doing an exchange, look at that column for a second, you'll see that you've got a $750,000 sales price, same one as the sales, but you're not going to have any capital gains tax today because you're doing a Section 1031 tax deferred exchange. So at this point, there's no tax due. It's all going to be deferred. That means that you're going to have $750,000 to invest, which also means that if that was 25% down, you'd be able to buy 300, uh, excuse me, $3 million worth of investment property. That's a $600,000 more expensive property just because you did a section 1031 exchange. So looking at the basic rules, the 1031 exchange allows the tax deferral one of long-term capital gains taxes. But there's some other taxes involved too that your CPA will point out. One of them is depreciation recapture tax, which is taxed at 25% of whatever the depreciation amount was that you had uh, taken over the lifetime of owning that investment. I have a, one of our exchange coordinators used to say, Uncle Sam is a Indian giver. I was, uh, when I was a kid, it was called an Indian giver. You give something to somebody, but they want it back. Well, that's what IRS is doing when it comes to the depreciation recapture tax. They're being an Indian giver. They're saying, we gave you a credit, now we want it back, and we want you to pay us 25% tax. The third 
uh, item that you see up on the screen is state taxes. Not every state has state taxes. There are six states in the United States that do not have a state income tax. But if they do have a state income tax, meaning uh, the remaining uh, states, they also will have their tax deferred by doing a section 1031 exchange. So these are some of the reasons why initially you want to have a taxpayer, hopefully a taxpayer will want to do a section 1031 exchange. What is like kind? I hear this over and over and over again. The, the statute is written like kind exchanges. So what is a like kind exchange? When it comes to real estate as a for 1031 exchanges, it's any type of investment real estate. So looking on the screen, you could exchange a piece of land for a single family house as long as that single family house was being used as an investment, not the house you live in, that's 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 not an investment under Section 1031 rules. But if you had a house that you were renting out, that obviously would qualify. You could exchange that land for a hotel or motel. You could do a 30 year lease. Now, this is really technical. And I realize that we have some CPAs uh, looking at this particular presentation. Please understand that if a tenant has a lease that has 30 years or more to go on it, that is defined under federal law as a piece of ownership of that real estate. And that lease, if it still has 30 years to go on it, can be exchanged for a regular piece of property. Any of the types of pieces of property that you see as examples up on the screen. It could be an agricultural piece of property. Any of these pieces of property that you see on the screen can all be exchanged between each other. So an apartment building can be exchanged for a piece of raw land, a single family residence, if it's an investment, hotel, motel, 30 year lease, apartment building, multifamily, et cetera. Everything there, if it's an investment property, will qualify as like kind. So the next question is, what is not like kind? What is ineligible? And if you look on the screen, you'll see some examples. Well, you'll see in a second, there, there we go. Uh, partnership interests are not like kind. If the partnership owns a piece of real estate, the partnership can do a 1031 exchange, but you can't sell the interest in the partnership and do a 1031 exchange. And that is extremely technical. So one of the reasons why we have such a wonderful staff uh, here at Affiliated is we're going to be able to delineate for you the differences in your particular situation. So obviously, as soon as you think you want to do a 1031 exchange, you want to be able to call us, contact us, and we'll be able to tell you what you can do, what you can't do, and what you should do. Obviously, a, a sale of a partnership interest is not going to qualify, nor will stock in trade or other property held primarily for sale called inventory. So you very well could um, be producing widgets at a factory. Well, you can't exchange the widgets. You could exchange the building. That, that may be an investment or property used in a trade or business, but the widgets are not. That is inventory. That will not qualify. Let's look at stocks and bonds. Stocks and bonds are not real estate. That's personal property. And even though a company may own real estate, you cannot buy their stock uh, and use that to be able to do a Section 1031 exchange. It's not like kind. What about certificates of trust or beneficial interest in a trust? Again, it's the same idea as a stock and bond. It's not the exact same thing. It's the, the ownership of the real estate is fine, but the, the entity that owns the real estate, in this case, the trust, that will not qualify for a Section 1031 exchange. Any other types of securities or evidences of indebtedness? I get asked all the time, all of us get asked all the time. Uh, we probably get this question uh, every other week. Well, what about if I own a mortgage or a deed of trust on a piece of property? That's personal property. Even though that personal property may have a lien on a piece of real estate, that would not qualify for Section 1031 exchange. Primary residences do not 
qualify. Let me say that again. Primary residences do not qualify for a section 1031 exchange. Just does not work. That's not an investment under the eyes of the Internal Revenue Code and Section 1031. What is the benefits of a 1031 exchange? And you know, Stephen Weiner went over a bit of the benefits and you know what really a 1031 exchange is or what like kind is. But what is the benefit when you purchase a property or replace that property when you're selling in order to do an exchange? Uh, one of the things is optimization. The effectiveness uh, and the use of the code will allow you to not only, in Mr. Weiner's example, purchase a more expensive property or investment property, but also let you defer the taxes as well, allowing you to utilize um, those gains and utilize the money that you have in that property you're selling to purchase your replacement property. Uh, multiplication or diversification. And I get this, I, we get asked this question many times, can you sell one property and purchase more than one? Uh, yes, of course, the IRS wants you to purchase as many properties as possible so you can uh, stimulate the economy. So you can sell one property and purchase one, two, three, four, multiple properties, and this will multiply your portfolio, your investments, and also diversify your portfolio. You can sell a single family home and you can purchase uh, two investment condos and a vacant land. So long as you're buying these properties as investment properties, that's exactly what the code was written for and exactly what the IRS wants you to do. And repetition. Um, a very big thing here at Affiliate 1031 is we like to say DTD or defer to DUP. Um, just continue to defer the capital gains taxes, continue to reinvest the money, continue to use a 1031 exchange, and continue to use the code to your benefit, um, specifically because if you defer till death and you continue to defer, your heirs will receive a step up in basis, and that tax will no longer be payable at that moment. So it sounds like there's a lot of information in there that you gave of someone who was really interested in building their portfolio. You mentioned something about you know passing it along to your heirs. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, a lot of the uh, opportunity that's available for someone who is starting off as a real estate investor that's interested in actually building a portfolio that they could leave for their family, for the next generation. So it's very important to understand that this code is specifically written for investors and it's and it's great for young investors or, or new investors to understand the code and the benefits of it, such as, you know, obviously purchasing your property where you defer your gains and keep the money in your pocket or in the property that you're gonna be purchasing, but also what is it for the future, right? And it's also an estate planning tool in itself. Um, so if you defer till death or you repeat until death and you continue to do 1031 exchanges at the moment of death, your beneficiaries or heirs, that basis, which might've been, you know, in Mr. Winner's example or in the earlier slides, 100,000, now just raise to the value of the property at the moment of death. Um, so if your heirs or beneficiaries or your kids or your grandkids decide to sell that property, then they won't be paying any tax because the basis is now stepped up to what the property is worth at the moment of death. Great insight and, and more information you can find at the website, uh, Affiliated 1031. There's information to download and feel free to put in your email address so that you can be plugged into more webinars like this where we really dig into more information on how to build your portfolio. So next we'll move into a little bit more information from Ricky about the uh, benefits um, of uh, 1031. And so see, these are some of the benefits that I went over, uh, you know, the diversification, the multiplication, the consolidation is just the opposite. You can sell two properties, three properties and consolidate into one more expensive property. You're creating leverage with your funds and with your equity in the in sale of the investment property. Uh, the cash flow, you know, the more expensive property you're going to purchase and the more you diversify or multiply your portfolio, the more cash flow you will most likely have in the real estate investment community. Uh, management relief, you might be consolidating and you'll have less management relief that you need to worry about, increased depreciation across the properties, and as well as estate planning, which I just discussed as a step up in basis to the beneficiaries or heirs of your estate. Uh, this is an incredible tool, not only for investment, but for estate planning. And as everyone ever says, you know, just keep the money on your side and always reinvest is what the IRS wants you to do and stimulate the economy. Awesome. Thank you for sharing the benefits. And now we'll move on with Mr. Weiner, to talk about what we call the sale of the relinquished property. And this is the exchange uh, first step. And so Mr. Weiner is going to go ahead and take us through that process. Okay. The first thing I want to do, however, before we talk even about the whole process, is I always suggest that the client, we're going to call the exchanger, either the exchanger or the client, 
from here on out, I always suggest that there be a cooperation clause in the in the contract. Now, when the exchanger slash client goes and sells that property, there will be a real estate contract for sale done. There should be a cooperation clause. In effect, what the cooperation clause says is that the other party agrees to cooperate with the client in order for them to be able to do a Section 1031 exchange. Uh, if it's in Florida and it's a residential transaction, they have, they mean in the state of Florida, has in their residential contract uh, a cooperation clause. I helped write that 27 years ago. It's still being used today. And it's very, very important because in effect, it says to the other side, again, that both parties agree to cooperate to allow one party, in this case, our client, to be able to consummate a Section 1031 exchange. So what happens on a 1031 exchange? We're in the exchange process right now. We sign a contract. We um, uh, then close on a transaction. From the day we close, we're going to have certain timelines. We're going to talk about that uh, a, bit, a little bit later, timelines. But we have certain timelines that we have to proceed. The money from that closing will not go to the exchanger or client. Those funds will go directly to affiliated 1031's trust account where they will remain. And when the client is ready to close at the end, and we'll talk about uh, the step two process in a minute, but what happens is the funds will come from us, affiliated 1031, to whoever the closing agent is on the purchase of the replacement property, and the client exchanger never touched the funds. And if the client never touched the funds, IRS says, aha, you didn't have a sale and then a purchase, you just exchange properties. So that's the theory of Section 1031. What's involved? Well, uh, our documentation, I'm, I'm very happy to say, is has been reviewed by IRS, uh, has approved it. We're one of the few companies that can say that. And, and our documentation is like 32 pages of documents. So it's a lot of documentation, but uh, very well written and has been approved. And the most two most important parts of that documentation are the written exchange agreement and the assignment of sales contract. The assignment of sales contract in effect says that the other party agrees to give us affiliated 1031, the funds on the sale of the relinquished property. And when the exchanger buys on the purchase of the replacement property, that that seller, because now we're the buyer, that seller agrees to accept the funds from us. All of that documentation, obviously, we prepare. How long do you have to hold the property? It's the next item that you see on the screen. Well, the relinquished property must be held for a reasonable time. What is a reasonable time? And actually, there is no, in the statute, there's no timeline as to how long is a reasonable time. IRS likes to take the position to prove that you're an investor and not a dealer. A dealer is a person who buys a piece of property, uh, maybe fixes it up relatively quickly, flips it, means resells it relatively quickly, and they're doing it as a business. Remember, an investor is not a business. An investor is an investor. A business is a dealer, a de person who's dealing in real estate back and forth, back and forth. That is not an investor. So what is a reasonable time? IRS likes to take a position that two years you should be holding that property. I think that's wrong. I think a year and a day, which is what long-term capital gains is, is the valid time period. And practically, from a practical standpoint, it is a year and a day. So that should never be an issue. If you've held the property for a year and a day and you have the intent that this is an investment property, not something that you're gonna flip, then that should be your reasonable time. Again, on the proceeds, remember the proceeds from the sale come to the qualified intermediary, affiliated 1031. We put it in our trust account, doesn't go anywhere but there. We don't, it's not invested anywhere. The money just stays at the bank. And 
And we now have those funds. And when you're ready to close on your purchase of the replacement property, those funds then go out to that closing agent, does not go to the taxpayer, goes to the closing agent. And by doing that, the taxpayer never touched the funds. And IRS says you had a valid 1031 exchange. Next. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, step two. And we're talking about identification. Um, there are three different rules. Yes, I said there are three different rules. I emphasize that because you have CPAs, uh, accountants, sometimes realtors that only know about the one rule, which is called the three property rule. That three property rule, quite frankly, is the easiest one to do. And that's the re reason why most people know about it. But there are really three options. So let's talk about all three options so that you're going to be smarter than most other people in the industry that are trying to do a 1031 exchange. The three property rule says this, it could be three properties doesn't matter what the value of the property is. So if you don't want to pay any tax, you want to defer it at this point in time, your tax, you're going to buy a property of equal value or more than what you just sold. So if you had originally bought a property for a dollar and now you're selling it for a hundred dollars, you'd have a $99 profit. But if you used all $100, less certain expenses, but if you used all $100 to buy another property of equal value or more, no problem three properties you're allowed to identify if you use the three property rule. So you could identify a property for 75, another for 30, another for $250. If you bought the 75 and the 30, that obviously is 105. That's more than your 100, no problem. If you bought that more expensive, the $200 property, no problem, more expensive, you pay no tax. But if you only bought the $75 one, you'd pay tax on $25, the other 75 would be uh, tax deferred. Three property rule allows you to buy more than one property. So you could buy all three of the properties if you wanted, no issue. But what happens if you want to identify more than three? Let's pretend that you want to identify four or more. There are two other rules. One's called the 200% rule. The other one's called the 95% rule. The 200% rule says this. It says that you can identify four or more properties, but when you add them all together, they can't total more than 200% of what you just sold. So if you just sold for $100, your, your relinquished property, that would mean that all the properties together that you identified, if you're going to use the 200% rule, can't total more than $200. That's 200% of 100, right? So uh, you could identify four or more. You could identify 25 if you wanted, but all of them together couldn't total more than what you just sold. The third option is called the 95% rule. It says that you can uh, identify four more properties, but you must literally purchase 95% of the fair market value of all the properties you identified. I'm telling you, that's kind of hard to do. But we did have a client recently that went and bought, uh, in this case, something like 11 units in a building, uh, same building. I automatically thought that it was a uh, builder that he was buying from, or, you know, construction, brand new building. No, it was a building that was about uh, six, six years old. He was buying from 11 different people in that building. And in his case, he had to buy all 11 units. He, he was successful. He did it within the timelines. He bought 11 units from 11 different people, which is really hard to do because you would figure one of them would fall through, but all of them went through and he qualified under the 95% rule. Okay, now let's, uh, uh, let's talk about the timelines. Uh, we have two timelines that I want you to be aware of. One is called the 180 day rule. Uh, the 180 day rule says that you must purchase your replacement property within 180 days of the day that you closed the day of closing is day one. So if you close on January 1, whatever 180 days is, including January 1 is day one, that would be your last day that you would be able to close on your replacement property. You have only 45 days to uh, 
identify what you might like to buy. And that is a hard time also. It's a hard rule to follow. So I tell people, and I know Steve and Ricky tell them too, uh, you know, you signed your contract, you're selling, start looking now. Don't wait to close. You don't have to have a contract. And by the way, you never have to have a contract, but it's a good idea to start looking uh, as soon as you can for a possible replacement property. Uh, the last slide I'm going to copy right, uh, uh, talk about, I should say right now, is called the napkin rule. And it's an interesting rule. And I will tell you how it came about. It, uh, we were, we meaning I and, and uh, some other people at our national convention were at lunch and we were trying to figure out how can we explain to the public simply uh, the rules of section 1031. And one of the people sitting at the table wasn't me, we're at a fancy restaurant, but one of the people took his napkin, it was a cloth napkin, and he took out a pen and we started discussing what, what, what those rules could be. And we wrote it down and it's now known as the napkin rule. So here, it is, here are the rules. Uh, all cash proceeds from the sale of the relinquished property must be reinvested in a replacement property, or you're gonna pay tax on the difference. So again, my example is if you sold your relinquished property for $100 and you only bought $75 with a replacement property, you have a possible tax on 25, the other 75 would obviously qualify for the section 1031 exchange. The next part, the purchase price of the replacement property must be at least as much as a sales price of the relinquished property, you're going to pay tax, which is the example that I just gave you. The purchaser, and this is important, the purchaser of the replacement property must be the same as the seller of the relinquished property or be a disregarded entity. What does that mean? It means that Stephen Weiner, if I was selling my relinquished property, Stephen Weiner must be the buyer of the replacement property or I could form a new LLC that Stephen Weiner owns. I'm the same person and it would just have to be owned by me. I could do that. that would, that's called a disregarded entity because it would, my, on my tax return, it would go straight through to me. The last part, for safe harbor protection, exchange funds should be held by a qualified intermediary. If you haven't done this already, you need to write down our contact information. We have our toll free number is as easy as you can get. 877 hour O U R, look on your telephone, hour 1031. We couldn't make it simpler, the phone number for you. So that's the ways that you can contact us. So awesome. And now we're going to move on and hear a little bit from Steve Gurian. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about how to select a qualified intermediary. Oh, good morning again, guys. Um, so selecting a qualified intermediary, <clears throat> it's, it's a couple of things you guys need to, you know, take into consideration when selecting qualified intermediary. And as 1031 exchange agents, um, here at affiliate 1031, one thing that sets us apart is that we're all lawyers and we're an attorney only qualified intermediary. And that's, that's very rare in the industry. So one of the first things I want to talk about is security. What better way to ensure that the transaction is going to go smoothly and that your funds are secure than by entrusting those funds with a group of attorneys. Security is the most important concern when dealing with any kind of 1031 transaction. So ensure that your qualified intermediary, intermediary um, is one that you can trust your clients with, your referral sources with, because um, again, they're gonna be in charge of, you know, potentially, you know, millions of dollars. So knowing that you're dealing with attorneys exclusively, um, and, and here at Affiliated 1031, you're always going to have an attorney assigned to your file. You're always going to speak to an attorney. You're never going to speak to, uh, you know, any other employee, a secretary or, or a paralegal or anything like that. Attorneys are always assigned to every file and you're just going to get that customized service, which brings us to our next point is service. We're not a huge operation. We're also not small. Um, your clients need to work closely with their qualified intermediary. So again, if you have an attorney that you're, you're confiding in, that you're, you're able to speak to when you pick up the phone and they answer your calls all the time, that's the type of service you would get with Affiliated 1030 and experience. Uh, my partners over here, as you can see, essentially wrote the book on uh, 1031 transactions. So again, uh, attorney owned, everyone has been doing this for, for quite a long time. And uh, 
all of our documents, as we said, are, have been uh, tried and, and true and have been tested, even with the IRS. So you know that everything is being done expeditiously. And uh, again, attorneys, that, that's, the, that's the way to do any kind of transaction. And then finally, uh, everything is legal. So it's recommended that every transaction is reviewed and overseen, not only by us, but you should have your own tax advisor uh, apart from your, your exchange agent that's working on your transaction. So get your CPAs involved, get your tax attorneys involved if you're dealing with a complex transaction and you'll make sure you'll be able to close on time every time and you'll have a successful 1031. Awesome, great insights, great information, Stephen. And now, you know, we talked mostly about the process, the general 1031 exchange, but I know that there's some other scenarios that are out there. And so I wanna go ahead and let Ricky dive into a few of the different scenarios or complex uh, transactions that may take place. So every 1031 exchange example or anything we've been discussing so far has been a standard forward exchange. Uh, there's different kind of exchanges that qualify under the code. And this is just a list of some of them. Um, these are just a bit more complex and not as seen as much, but it is something that everyone should know and understand. And it is something that everyone should utilize as well, because it's another option to do a 1031 exchange and be able to defer your taxes and be able to, you know, reinvest that those funds that you have. So one of them being a construction exchange, uh, an improvement exchange, just briefly, it's pretty much when you are purchasing something, you want to do a construction or improvement on it, such as purchasing a vacant land and improving a construction on it. This will qualify for a 1031 exchange under certain circumstances and scenarios and fighting following certain guidelines. Um, a reverse exchange, this is in essence, the opposite of a forward standard exchange, where you are going to purchase the replacement property prior to selling the relinquished property. Um, we do have a separate webinar and separate uh, thing on this, probably 15, 20 minutes long. Um, it's located on our website, our social media, if you would like to see it as well. Um, related party rules, partnership property, condo conversions, contract exchanges. These are a lot of complex different exchanges, which we can't get into because we don't have the time today. Um, but these are different exchanges, which every exchanger, every investor, every realtor, every attorney should know about because everyone should know how to qualify for a 1031 exchange if it isn't a standard exchange and if they could qualify under one of these exchanges as well. So there's all sorts of other scenarios that Ricky sort of went into. And again, reminder to go to the affiliated 1031 website and sign up so that you can take advantage of all of the in-depth knowledge and information the affiliated 1031 team has. And I wanna just go ahead and let um, Stephen Weiner comment a little bit about some of the contract exchanges or condo conversions, because we are here in Florida and we know that a lot of these things may come up. So let's talk first about condo conversions. Uh, I call this case the little old lady from Pasadena because it did occur in Pasadena, California. And what happened was this lady and her husband owned a 20 unit, uh, excuse me, a 20 unit apartment building uh, in Pasadena, California for years. The husband dies. Now the, the, the wife uh, decides that she's going to sell this complex. She's told by her realtor that she should uh, really convert these apartments into condominiums. She can get a lot more money and the realtor can get more in commissions. They'll both win. And in fact, the realtor said, I'm going to be able to sell these units as condos. No problem. You will get this extra money. The problem is, and, and by the way, she did just that. The, pro the problem is now she wanted to do uh, at 1031 exchanges and IRS comes back and says, wait a second, you had an investment property, an apartment building all these years. You've now changed what that apartment building is. It's no longer an investment. It's now, you're, you've now made yourself an investor by converting that condo building into a part of uh, that apartment building into condos. You've now become an investor. We're not going to let you have the right to Section 1031. And more important than that, you're now going to be taxed no longer at long-term capital gains. You're going to be taxed at ordinary income, which is much, much higher. So it, it, it's something that you need to discuss with us before you, you go forward with that type of transaction. Now, on a contract exchange, 
which by the way, I think we're probably one of the only companies in the United States that do these. It's, it's extremely interesting. I've given this lecture twice to my fellow brethren, to my competition at the national convention. I've been, the, I, was, I was the keynote speaker on these issues and, and gave an hour presentation just on contract exchanges. So what is it? I'm gonna briefly, briefly talk about it. We, we don't have that much time to, to go through it uh, completely here, but pretend you have a fan that's, collect, uh, that's uh, connected to uh, an electrical outlet. And you've got a wire that goes from the fan to the electrical outlet. If you were to cut that wire, what would you find inside that, that cord? Well, you're gonna find a bunch of wires intertwined in between each other. Well, under IRS law, it's called the bundle of rights. If you own one of those wires, you own a part of that cord, obviously. Well, it's the same thing with real estate. So you could very well have a contract for on a piece of property. And if you owned it long enough, remember, reasonable time. We, talk, we talked about that earlier. But if you own that contract for an, a, 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 at least a year and a day, and now you decide to sell that contract to someone else, you could probably do a 1031 exchange because you own one of the wires of ownership of that property. That, that developer that is developing that property that you're waiting for them to finish that project on, they can't sell that unit to anyone else. You own that right. They've signed a contract with you to sell you that unit. So that is one of the ownership rights. Now, there are a bunch of ownership rights in owning, owning real estate. I mean, there's you can loan it, you can buy again, get, get a, a loan on it, you can uh, resell it, you can live in it, you can um, rent it out, uh, you can paint it, you can improve it, you can do a whole slew of things. But the one wire we're talking about is the contract right uh, of purchase and that, that you own and you could exchange that. So that I wanted just to talk about those two items. Wow, lots of nuance, lots of great information, lots of you know what I would say, high-end knowledge about real estate and how to strategically go about looking at your investments and how you're going to build your portfolio and how to best take advantage of these strategies. One of the things that differentiates Affiliated 1031 from all others is the fact that they do have that experience, especially when it comes to these complex other scenarios. And again, very, very basic knowledge and information today feel free to hit that website so that you can plug in to the more in-depth experience, knowledge, and information on how you can skillfully build your real estate investment portfolio and take full advantage of the 1031 exchanges. And as we get into that, one of the other complexities, we'll jump into uh, allow Stephen Gurian to speak a little bit about uh, FERPA. So FERPA is a, a big issue here in South Florida and in a lot of like cosmopolitan cities, international cities. And one of the big misconceptions I always hear is, can a foreigner do a 1031 exchange? And a lot of people say they can't because they're foreigners, but that's not true. Foreigners can do a 1031 exchange, but there's a little nuance there because foreigners have to remit 15% of that contract sales price to the IRS, then they technically would not be using 100% of their net sales proceeds towards uh, the acquisition of a new property. But there are ways around that. Um, and I actually do a, a whole hour class just on FERPTA, and we talk about 1031 exchanges. But uh, there's a couple of things you can do that you guys should be aware of. It's just some, you know, some uh, compliance paper with the IRS, and you actually can do a 1031 exchange with foreigners. So don't worry about FERPTA. FERPTA won't kill a 1031 transaction. Um, you just have to speak with, you know, knowledgeable, you know, professionals such as ourselves, and we can help guide you through these complex, you know, 1031 exchanges. So as these guys at Affiliated 1031 specialize in South Florida area and really have the expertise and the experience to help foreigners, as we know, Miami is the hotbed, the international mecca of the United States. So what better place to really understand and get in-depth information than from Affiliated 1031 on how to take full advantage if you are a foreigner wanting to invest and really build that asset portfolio up and take full advantage of the American dream and what that provides for you, especially when you look at passing it on to future generations when you move. So I want to just go ahead and close out today's uh, webinar and allow Ricky, Stephen, and Stephen, <laughs> yes, two Stevens, uh, Wayner and Gurian, to just share any closing remarks they may have um, or anything to uh, you know add value to all of the listeners today. 
So we'll start with Ricky. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you for taking the time out of the day to, to join our webinar. Um, we are here specifically because we're attorneys and we love to educate uh, you know, everyone in regard to 1031. We believe that everyone should understand what it is. Uh, understand its benefits and what it could do not only for them but for you know their you know the generations after them it is an incredible tool which should be utilized by absolutely everyone um, who is a taxpayer and who can be you know purchasing and selling real estate investment property um, so please feel free to follow us on social media you can also uh, go to our website we have an ebook that's for download which is an educational book that you'll be able to read up a little bit more on 1031s and um, feel free to reach out to us whenever you want to Yes, and um, we are and have been receiving a few questions that have come in. So as we let uh, the, these guys wrap up with final comments, then we'll just jump right into a few questions that came in so that we can get you guys on to your day. Okay, so I'm just going to add that Ricky was uh, being very nice by not pointing out that he's becoming and has become the reverse exchange guru. Uh, Steve and Ricky really get into reverse exchanges, and it is a complex issue. So is FERPTA, the Foreign Investment Real Property Tax Act. So you're going to want to go to them. I should also point out to you that everybody but me speaks Spanish. So so that you have an advantage that if you have a client or or, uh, or a person that does not understand English thoroughly but does understand Spanish, they can come to us and we obviously can uh, better explain that particular situation or that issue that they have on a Section 1031. Qualifying an intermediary is extremely important. You need that for your 1031 exchange. You should be going to affiliated. Your turn, Steve. Thank you. So just uh, one final remark is a lot of people say, you know, when can I do this? When can I start a 1031? Obviously, sooner is, is better than later. But the reality is uh, with the quality of service that we can provide, we could even do it, you know, a day or two before closing. You know, we can provide that service. And like I said, we can get you guys to the closing table on time, every time. So if you guys need any information whatsoever, check us out online. We'd love to educate and we'd love to differentiate ourselves, you know, with with everyone else uh, doing 1031 transactions. So if you guys ever need anything, feel free to reach out. Our info is there on the slide. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. And so a few questions that came in that I'm just going to throw out and any of you guys feel free to jump in. First question is, can I do a 1031 with my home and or with my vacation home? So two part question. One is, can I do it with my home? And the other is, can I do it with my vacation home? Okay, I'll jump in on that one. It's a, uh, for us, it's an easy question. You cannot use your personal residence as a 1031 exchange. That's not an investment. Now, if you're using, uh, let's go to the second part of the question, which was vacation or second homes. If you don't use it more than 10 days a year or 10, uh, excuse me, 14 days a year or 10% of the time it's rented out, the property may qualify your vacation home in your mind may qualify. So for example, if you rented it out for 300 days in a, in a year and you used it uh, 10%, which would be 30 days or less, that would still qualify for 1031 exchange. That's kind of the exception on the vacation uh, issue. But again, your personal residence will not qualify for a section 1031 exchange. Thank you for that insight. Next question up is, what is DST? Okay, I'm going to answer that one too, I guess. Uh, Delaware Statutory Trust. Uh, in the old days, it was called a TIP, which stands for tenancy in common. For those of us that are attorneys, we went to law school, we were taught that tenancy in common means that, that uh, Stephen and Ricky and I buy a piece of property together. One of us predeceases uh, ourselves. Uh, it, the, my interest, if I was the first one to die, since I'm the oldest between these three, uh, would go to my heirs. That's what a tenancy in common is. Well, there's some, so there's some people out there selling interest just like that, a, a, an undivided interest in a piece of property. Today, what's most prevalent is called a Delaware Statutory Trust. You can buy a, 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 an interest in a Delaware Statutory Trust, which will qualify as a replace as a possible replacement property for you, for yourself, 
Uh, and it's just like a check. Great, great insights. But again, you just continue to really spell out the complexities and all of the nuance involved in these 1031 exchanges and why it's so important to really go and work with someone like affiliated 1031 to sort of work through that as you build that out. The next question is, will I get audited? And it sounds like with all of that, all those complications and back and forth, uh, will I get audited? And for this one, I think we're gonna jump in with uh, Stephen Geary who has some experience uh, in, the, in that space. So we'll let him share. So it's very rare that anyone gets audited, you know, period. Um, obviously, some things have changed lately. We have, what, 86,000 new agents uh, employed in the IRS. So, so I guess there is potentially a risk of greater audit. But, but even still, uh, audit rates are really low. Um, this really isn't something that's on the IRS's mind at the moment. Um, but again, if you work with, uh, you know, true professionals in this industry, you know, make sure everything is documented correctly. You abide by your timelines. You know, you use 100% of those net proceeds. There's, there's really nothing to be worried about. So even if you get audited, um, you have the backup. And here at Affiliate 1031, you, you'll, you'll get everything done the right way. Awesome. And the last question is, what do you guys do for fun here at Affiliated 1031? Come on, man. <laughs> we'll give that to Ricky. Uh, what do we do for fun? Um, myself, personally, I uh, go skydiving, travel the world, and we, we and me, myself, and, and Steven, we enjoy wine a lot. So we, we definitely drink wine. And, and on our fun time, we decide to talk about 1031s and, and taxes. So <laughs> I don't know if it's that much fun, but we, we enjoy having fun. Uh, so I like to travel a lot, and, and I know Steven does as well. And we like art and, and wine. So now we have a question from Ryan. Uh, and the question is, can I still do a 1031 exchange on a property that is an investment property, but has not been rented out for an extended period of time for one reason or another? Uh, basically, do I have to show any form of rental income on an investment property? Okay, so the first thing is, is you have to prove that it's a, an investment property. So intent is a, is, is a key word. You do not have to rent the property out. Uh, I, we, we've had an example, one that was in Lake Tahoe, where I, and I bring this up because it was a strange case when it occurred. It was a fireman who had rented out uh, an investment property for over a year. He comes back and his tenant uh, damaged the property. Uh, it, he didn't want to ever rent it again, but it was still an investment property. He never rented it for 10 years. He didn't use it either, but he never rented it for 10 years. He was only looking for a appreciation in the property. He had major appreciation in that property. He was able to do a 1031 exchange and he had to explain to IRS why he didn't have any rental income. And he pointed out, I, I, I got gun shy from tenants with the amount of damages that were done by my initial tenant. So he, he never did it. Uh, he did a 1031 exchange, but he never rented it out, I guess is what I meant to say, uh, subsequent to that first tenant. And it qualified. Let me point out one other thing, too. Uh, you, you can go to our website, but I, I want to, again, correct, give you the correct toll-free telephone number to contact us, which is 1-877-USE-USE-1031. And it's real simple. So 877-USE-1031, that's our toll-free number. That's great. We want to thank you guys again for coming today. And uh, we've got one more question, one more question in from the group. Awesome. Thanks, Abdul. This question's from Alejandro. If combining my 1031 with a family member, also in a 1031 exchange, I've been made aware I'd have to take possession with him as tenants in common. What are the cons of doing so? I don't know if there's really many cons in doing so. I think there's more pros than cons in doing so, to be quite honest. Um, if you do it this way, and this is, uh, you know, heading into the, you know, the legal advice in the legal world, is you are able to both do a 1031 exchange into a property and you both own it as tenants in common with your undivided interest, let's say 50% each. Then in the future, when you sell that real estate investment property, you'll be able to, in essence, both do your own separate 1031 exchanges on each sale on your 50% undivided interest of that sale. I see it more as a pro than a con. I don't really see many cons as to it other than uh, getting into an investment with a family member that may be kind of tricky <laughs> at that portion. But other than that, there's a lot more pros to cons in that moment. And uh, that would be my advice to you.
Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions that come in? We're all set. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. This is the first of many educational series from Affiliated 1031. If you've enjoyed what you heard, what you learned today, please feel free to share affiliated1031.com. And again, as Ricky mentioned, download the free educational ebook. We look forward to sharing more in-depth information about 1031 exchange strategies with you moving forward. Take care.